dive right into the passage. If you have your Bible or your app on your phone, we're going to be in John 3. Um, and we're going to start in verse 16. If you want to, you can read it on the screen behind me. There it is. So lovely. Um, and you're going to be very familiar with the first part of this passage of Scripture. And then you're going to be very familiar about the part where you stop reading. And we'll dive into that as we go. So, um, okay, starting in verse 16, carrying through verse 21, let's jump in. I'm reading the ESV this morning. It's, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Oh, that is so good. And that is usually where I stop. <laughs> That's usually where I stop, and I'm like, this is so good. Jesus is so good. He did not come into the world to condemn it. He loves me. He's here. He's God's so generous. But um, I want to invite you to journey with me through the rest of the passage. So it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. I came to preach this morning, okay? This is probably not going to be like a cozy, casual, like Christmas sweater message. And that's okay. It's okay. I wore a holiday outfit, and I'll smile a lot. But I, last week, I told Lyle when he got um, walked off the stage, he shared the Advent message on joy. And if you haven't had the chance to listen to that message, you have to listen to it. You need it for 2021. You really need it. I was like, that was the best message you've ever preached, ever, yeah. <laughs> ever. And so now I'm having to follow up on that. And <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little bit... I'm, I'm nervous, right? Because there's, there's really a lot of goodness in this passage, but there's a whole lot of truth. And I want to invite you into the journey of self-reflection to see how your life is measuring up to the truth that's in the word of God. And I really want to encourage us that we step into 2021 with our eyes locked on the love of Jesus understanding that if you read this passage without that love in mind, it gets really squirrely. But if you read it with a lens of love, then you understand his heart is for you. It might be tough, but it's good. So that's what we're going to embrace today. I talk about this passage so often from the standpoint of generosity when we're receiving tithe and offering. For God so loved the world that he, he gave, right? Right? Um, but today we're going to focus on that first part, for God so loved the world. The title of my message on this final Sunday of Advent is this, The Greatest Gift. And God has surely given the world the very best Christmas gift ever, right? Yes. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Honestly, I love Christmas because I can turn on any radio station and they're singing about Jesus. Yep. Yep. How sneaky of the Father. <laughs> All of you guys cynical about it being a Hallmark holiday, we're singing about Jesus, you know? You know, if they're not against us, they're for us, so. But I love the opportunity that the world has to rally around the person of Jesus because Jesus has this way about him where everyone is curious about Jesus, right? How many times have you heard, I'm not really into church, but I like Jesus? I've heard that a lot. I've said that before, I'm sure, at some point in my life, <laughs> probably while pastoring a church. I don't know how I feel about church, but i uh, super into Jesus. Um, but that is, that is the brilliance of the Father, is that the whole world is curious about Jesus, and all of the world is singing and saying and reciting and looking at the person of Jesus, and I'm so I, I, I feel sad that we don't take more advantage of the season in that way. 
Jesus is genuinely God's best gift, his only begotten. It's not just any old thing. You know, he came to the world for salvation, not condemnation. God didn't say, um, okay, Gabriel, you're like close to the, the good thing. So can you go and just like get the people in, in line? No, God didn't spare anything. He sent his best thing because he loves you. He loves you so very much. Jesus is a reflection of the heart of the Father. And what so often makes a gift great isn't necessarily the price of the gift, right? It's not what it like what you paid for it necessarily. It is the sacrifice behind what you paid for it that makes a gift so great. If you're a millionaire and you buy me, you know, like an expensive watch and you like casually can do that because that's what's in your bank account, that, wow, that's really special. Thank you so much for that. But it, like I know my bank account. So if Lyle like goes and buys me a really expensive watch because he saved for months and months and months and months and put money aside and like made a huge sacrifice to give me a gift that meant something to me, I'm like, oh, all of a sudden that watch becomes so much more valuable. It costs the same for him and for, you know, the other guy, but it was the sacrifice that made that really communicated the value, right? So that's the heart of the Father. He could have sent any good thing. Everything the Father's made is good. Did you know that? In creation, he looks at the world. He says, oh, it's good, except for with humans until he made the two, and then that's when he said it was good. But the reality is God could have sent anything that was good, but he didn't just send what was good. He sent his best, and that's what communicated his value for you, his love, his adoration, his desire for you, and that's what makes Jesus the best gift. Lyle and I, when we were um, dating, we were in ministry and therefore probably not making the most dollars in the world. And I remember when it was time for us to get engaged, I was like, okay, like maybe I'm going to get a ring, maybe not. Maybe we should just like bust open a Cracker Jack box and like dig around and see if we can find something. Um, and I remember he completely surprised me. I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know how you can talk to your girlfriend and still somehow surprise her that you're going, it's like you talk about it. It's not like a surprise that you want to get married. So it always blows my mind that you guys can keep it such a secret. And Lyle did a great job keeping it a secret. And when the day came for us to get engaged, he lovingly looked at me, dropped down to one knee, and opened that ring box upside down. <laughs> the ring was at the top. It was awesome. I did this. I was like, <laughs> looking at it. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, not because Lyle proposed to me, but because the ring was super pretty. And I grabbed it out of the box, and I put it on my own finger, and I was like, oh, yes, yes, I will marry you. <laughs> and then I immediately said, who did you kill, and what did you steal in order to get this ring? Because I know what you're working with, and this was not what you were working with. And all of a sudden, the story that he shared the effort that he went to to make this special for me communicated so much of his value for me. And it was like, oh, I like told him, I'm like, never upgrade my ring. This is the best. I have like nightmares that he gets me something nicer and prettier. And I'm like, I cry because it, it wasn't what it cost. It was the sacrifice that it took to get it to me that made the most impact on my heart. And it's, Honestly, like, that is the whole reason that Jesus came. That's why the Father sent him. God's primary motive is his love for you, his grace, his mercy. We read that in the first two verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to you so that you wouldn't perish in your darkness and in your funk, that you would actually come to the light and that you would actually live a life of wholeness and fruitfulness and not waste your life in darkness. It's his love for you that motivated him. And God loves the world. He really does. But not as we love the world. We love the world for what it can give to us, right? We love the world because we can, like, we can work hard and we toil and the ground comes up. There's a harvest. And we love the world because we can work hard and there's money and there's influence. And we're like, oh, 
cool. I, I have a love for the world in our sin nature. But God doesn't love the world like that. He loves the world in a selfless manner, right? He loves the world for what he can give to it. He's obsessed. He's obsessed with what he can give to you. He's so obsessed with showing you that he's good. He's so obsessed with if only you knew. If only you knew how much I loved you. We're so selfish sometimes. But God loved the world through the lens of redemption. And we can see in the, verse, in the early verses that the giving of the Son of Man is not, um, is not an accident. It's an intentional act of love. It's not an afterthought, a last-minute emergency plan. Love is central to the very nature of God. God is love. He doesn't have love. He embodies love. It's like he just moves in its love. He just speaks in its love. He corrects you in its love. It's like, you know, it's like everything he does is love. He cannot separate himself from love. And if we read the scripture, no matter how tough or challenging that it is through any other lens, then we will fail to understand the heart that God is speaking to us in. And that's why I was like, okay, when I got this passage of scripture, I'm like, I'm gonna have to share you the, share with you like the ooey gooey Christmas sweater side of things, like God loves you so much. But then I'm gonna have to sh share with you the, the other side of it, which is, hey, but if you don't choose him, there is a consequence and there's a cost for not choosing the good gift that's been released. Listen, love is never passive. Love is active. If you tell me that you love me, but you never text me back, I don't believe you. And that's okay. You don't actually, like, have to love me. It's fine. Oh, darn. Sorry. Didn't mean to. But, <laughs> but, the, but the reality is if you love someone, you prioritize. You use, your, you use what you have. You prioritize them in your affection. If my kids came up to me and I never looked them in the eye when they said, hey, mom, I need something, they would pretty much assume that I, had, I didn't care about them. If I didn't make them dinner, if I didn't help them wake up and get ready for school, some of you had experiences like that in your life where you were neglected by parents and you have a belief system that you are not worthy of being loved. You never translated it and said, oh, like, this is because my parent is so uh, so." not not lovely it's because I'm not lovely we have this way of interpreting um, neglect in a way that says that, oh man I'm so I'm not worthy but when Jesus came he came to flip the script because the truth is we weren't worthy to engage with the father we weren't and that's the part that's the other side which is the reality that I, I always read that scripture and it said, okay, Jesus came into the world to love the world, not condemn the world. And then it follows and it says, because the world was condemned already. And it was as if a light bulb went off in my head and I recognized it's, if I don't choose to receive the love and the gift that is Jesus Christ, it's not God sitting on the throne saying, okay, it's not like a test where I stand in front of him and he's like, presents me Jesus. And he's like, okay, when you don't choose him, you're condemned. That's not what happens. It's way more dire than that. You're already condemned without Jesus. He already set the sentence when, when Adam and Eve chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And the sentence was already released. And it was, it's been carrying on throughout all of history. Because when God speaks, it doesn't stop. It always keeps moving forward. And Jesus came onto the scene as a, as a gift. And what he did was he separated darkness from light. We were covered in darkness after the garden. The sentencing was already done. The judgment was already made. He said, listen, this is, this is what it is. In grief, he shared that. In tears, God condemns. In agony, he says, give them over to their depravity. In agony, he says that. But Jesus was the opportunity to walk in the light. If you don't want to follow Jesus... God's not sitting up in heaven saying, okay, now you're condemned because you didn't choose Jesus. You're already lost without him. You're already on a road to destruction without him. With him, he is it. He is the only hope to connection with the Father. 
And when the father let Jesus come into our reality and he laid the gift of his life on the table, we finally had a choice again. We had a choice in the garden, okay? And we chose wrong because we're really good at being human. <laughs> and I'm not better than Adam, and I'm certainly not better than Eve. So I, if I had been the first soul in the garden, trust me, I probably would have made the mistake for all of us too. Um, but the choice was made, and, and it's in his kindness and his goodness that he created another choice. So often I think we read through the scripture, and we're like, God is so mean. And I'm like, no, he's holy. God is so holy, and he's so good. He's so good. We just don't like coming to terms with the fact that we're not holy, too. And that's what this passage talks about. If we choose to lay aside the gift of Jesus, the blood that covers us, then we embrace darkness, and we, re we reject the light. And we don't let things come to the light because we're so obsessed with embracing our darkness. That is our default mode, right? I, you know, I'm like, some, sometimes I think, oh, I'm doing so good at life. Like, I'm, I'm being a good mom. I'm being a really present wife. I, like, I, I prayed for some people today. I pastored really good. I didn't yell at anyone. I'm doing really, really good. Doing really good. And there's like this ego thing that happens when we, for any moment of time, think that we can work out our own salvation. You cannot work out your own salvation before the Lord. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Your darkness needs Jesus to come and separate darkness from light. You have lived in, some of you are living in chaos right now because you've not invited the gift of Jesus into that area of your life. And he will be there, and he will separate darkness from light, and you will choose. You will get to choose because that's his goodness. You will get to choose. Do you want to walk in the light, or do you want to embrace the darkness? I didn't make up the rules. I'm so glad I didn't because they would be way worse than that. I'd just be like, okay, well, we're all screwed, okay. <laughs> and I'm so glad that God, the Father, made up the, the way to engage with him because he's so merciful, and he's so, so kind. Honestly, working out your own salvation reminds me of watching my kids try to do anything that they think they can do that I know that they absolutely cannot do. The other day, Remy, who's my middle daughter, she is fire in every way. <clears throat> She'll probably look at you with eyebrows and probably not engage with you at all. Um, but she was getting out of the car from school, and she has, like, this very adorable pink school backpack that's very much Remy-sized, and it works for her. I have a big diaper bag that's got who knows what kind of stuff in it, probably 32 diapers, a computer, and like three outfit changes for both me and Rua. And so she's like, she hops out of the car and she's like, Mom, can I get, can I get that bag? And I was like, no, like you're, it's as big as you are. And she's like, please, I can totally do it. You know, her fire coming through. She's like, I can do it. And I'm like, okay, sis, you got it. She like puts one arm in the strap. The other arm, imagine it's like resting on the, the van, like the entrance of the van sitting there. She sits up like this and takes one step and then another and then looks back at me and says, hey, mom, you got this? <laughs> that is us trying to work out our salvation. Jesus came so that when you took one foot in front of the other, you could actually look at the father and say, hey, can you take that? Before... That backpack was just the law. The law was given, and it was a reminder that we can't, we can't actually be connected to the Father without the person of Jesus. We were carrying around this heavy backpack like, okay, we think we can do it failing all the time because we're human and we're sinners by nature. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene, and we, get to, we literally catch eyes with the Father for the first time yeah. in years. Since the garden, we catch eyes with the Father. And we're like, oh, can you take this from me? And some of you are carrying around those heavy backpacks today. Some of you are carrying around the weight of trying to work it out yourself. And I'm here to tell you, you cannot work it out yourself. You have to go to Jesus. You have to come to him humbly. There is no third option. I wish there was. When Lyle and I have a disagreement, we're like, okay, we've searched for the third option, right? It's like, he's right. 
or usually I'm right, he's wrong. And, <laughs> and yeah, and so then, but we have to find a third option, right? So that we can stay connected. Cause I'm like, it's not going to work if we end up on our two sides of things. There is no third option in this matter. It's Jesus or it's darkness. You're already walking in condemnation, but through Jesus, you have perfect access to the Father who loves you with an everlasting love and wants to transform your life into the image of Jesus, which is just, it just blows my mind that we have the opportunity to do that. Honestly, if you don't choose the gift, it's going to cost you. You're going to waste your life working in darkness. Your deeds might be good, but they will be covered in darkness and the Father won't receive them. But through Jesus, it's acknowledging as a volunteer, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Wow. I volunteer. I'm, I, I don't have it all together. I, you know, God doesn't need you to be perfect to love you perfectly. You know that, right? That's so good. That's good. Jesus was already perfect for you, but what he does need you to do is surrender. Surrender. I volunteer my life for you, Jesus. He's not going to strong arm you into relationship. That's called abuse. He's going to invite you into a connection, and we're going to have to wave the white flag of surrender and say, I cannot do it on my own. I desperately need you. The acknowledgement of the need of redemption is voluntary self-judgment. I love that. It's like the ability to look at yourself and say with all honesty, I can't do it on my own. We as believers are not just judged because we have sin in our lives. Like, we're judged when we acknowledge the sin in our lives and then don't choose Jesus, right? It's like, it's like oh, I, I'm a sinner. Like, God, yes, we're, we all sin, okay? But we're all covered with the blood when we come to the Father through Jesus. And this is why the Advent is so important and why it's not a Christmas sweater message and why I'm telling you the truth for real, for real, because some of you need to be reminded again, you cannot do it on your own. You need Jesus. You couldn't do 2020 alone. You need Jesus. You are desperately searching for something to rescue you from the pain of the year. And I'm here to tell you it's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. That's the only one. He's the perfect gift. Because the Father is the perfect Father. We, as humans, we love darkness. <laughs> because when, when we can hide, we don't have to feel um, correction or maybe the presence of shame that comes when we recognize, oh, I'm doing stuff that's out of line with the will of the Father. And we... we create entire doctrines to protect our shame. So we're like, God doesn't mind this. So just, I have this little pet doctrine that's like, the Bible doesn't really say that. But it's because you're not ready to look at the reality that a good, loving father is talking to you about something and says, hey, I think you're wasting your life on that thing. I think you're living in darkness there. Can I invite you into the light? It might be painful for a moment, but it's better than wasting your life. It's better than wasting your life. Let God invite you into that relationship, but look at it through the lens of Jesus and look at it through the lens of love. One of the things that I find very comforting about the Father is that there's always an invitation back home, no matter what area of my life I'm running from him in. Because in any given season, there's an area of my life that I'm hiding from the Lord. I mean, like hiding as in a two-year-old hiding, playing hide-and-seek from their parents, but hiding something from the Lord. In every season of my life, there's something the Lord's trying to invite me into, like let me illuminate that thing, and he's always inviting. He never quits the invitation. It blows my mind. Like honestly... Our choice to live in the light is determined by what we cling to most. Do we cling to the person of Jesus or do we cling to our ego and our pride? Do we cling to having it all together, being right, looking good, sounding good, being good? Or are we clinging to the reality that we are in desperate need of a Savior? He's here. He arrived. The light of the world came. There's people, there are people living in this city that have no clue that the light of the world has come because we're so busy protecting our shame and our darkness and we're trying to keep it all here and try to be good and perfect. But listen, it's not working. The world is lost. They need Jesus. 
They need to know him. We need to know him. My dark spots need to know God. They need to know the love of the Father. We must never forget that the measure of the gift is reflective of the love of the giver. And I love that throughout the entirety of the passage, what you cannot neglect is the very first sentence, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And I love that when Jesus was sharing this, it was, it was almost a conversation of clarifying. There's nothing, there's no good work or work you could do in general that would please the Father more than Jesus. You know, he's good all by himself. You know, his love, his mercy, his blood, it's perfect. So today is a day to choose him and choose whatever area of life. We might all be in here. We might know Jesus. It's a, but there's an area of your life that you're thinking of right now that you're like, oh, I'm like definitely hiding that from the Lord. Oh, I definitely don't want to talk about that thing with the Lord. Like I'm really, really married to that idea and I just don't want to let it go. But if he's inviting you into transformation, it's for your benefit and it's because he loves you so much. And the fact that the invitation never stops wrecked me this week. I was talking with Lyle when we were prepping um, this message. And I was like, God, he's so vulnerable. And that's because perfect love is vulnerable. Did you know that God's track record is that humans always reject him? When Jesus came? The heart literally 100% of the time, except for there's exceptions, right? And they're credited as, the, you know, the man after God's own heart or, you know, you're perfect in faith, the father of the faith. Like there's, there are people that could understand that, that there was joy in staying connected to the father. But as a whole humanity, our hearts wander. We love to wander. God literally put Adam and Eve in perfection and in perfect connection with him. And our hearts still wandered. Still it blows my mind that the invitation never stops. He gave Jesus to the world so for everyone. That's what, the, that's what the Bible says. He gave Jesus so that everyone would come into relationship with him, but he knew only some would choose him. What a God. How vulnerable. Remember, he didn't just give the best angel. He gave his number one best thing. How many of you would give your house to someone who poorly stewarded and managed the rest of their life? I wouldn't. If you're lazy, you don't pay your bills on time, you are mean to your wife, like, I, I'm not giving you my house. I'm not giving you my best thing. I love that thing. I love my house, you know? But that's God. He's like, listen, for an opportunity to be connected, I'll give my best thing. I know that some are not going to choose me, but it's not going to stop the invitation from consistently and persistently going out to your heart. And some of you today are like, I showed up at church because it's a good thing to do before Sunday. Some of you are watching online as well, but the, the, the Father is pursuing you and the invitation is still available for you. What love and vulnerability. It blows my mind for people who constantly wander and reject. <laughs> he came for all of us. And there is, there is a light in that choice. The person of Jesus came to separate the light from the darkness. And he came to invite us to the Father. The gift also stirs curiosity for the giver or affection for the giver. When I was like seven maybe younger, I could have been younger. Mom and dad will probably remember this story, but it must have been a year where it's like, like the car broke down, the roof needed a fix, the water heater busted, everything in the same week for something. And it wasn't gonna be a year that we could get a, a ton of gifts as a family. Me and my siblings, we literally didn't care because we had a Christmas tree and we were happy and we were with mom and dad and eating cookies. Um, but there was just, you know, it just was one of those years. We were fine with it. We didn't mind. We probably didn't even know or could wrap our heads around it at the time. But something happened on one Christmas Eve when I was a kid, and um, <clears throat> it changed my life. We walked up the back stairs after having a, like a Christmas Eve dinner with some friends, and we get to the back door, and there's just presents piled up at the back door. 
And we're, well, first of all, there was a Fisher Price like kitchen set, something, and I was just, I was in love with it. So we're frantically searching through the gifts, trying to find the name of who it's from. My parents might know who it was from. I, I still don't know. I have some thoughts. But as a little kid, I spent months trying to figure out who gave the good gift. Months. I was a kid. I was like, who would do that? Who would give the good gift? And then you know what it stirred in me? I remember telling my mom, I got to do that for someone one day. Because the good gift is reflective mostly of the good giver. And Jesus came to show you the goodness of the Father and put you back in right relationship with the Father. When the light of the world came, it was a prophetic picture that happened in creation, which is why I very much believe that before the foundations of the earth, the Lamb was already slain on our behalf. Because when God said, let there be light, there was light and it's still happening. And then he reflects that same nature in the person of Jesus. And he said, let there be light in all of this darkness. And there still is. And it's still happening. And he's still for you. And he wants to transform you and bring you out of your grief and into your redemption. And wants to bring you into connection with the Father. The light of Jesus is brighter than the light of the sun in the sky. What's happening on the inside of you when you choose to be in relationship with Jesus is the same thing that happened at creation. And I love, that's how I know it's not an accident. That's how I know it's like everything is strategic and planned and God is so much bigger and he thinks so much more long-term than we do. And today is a day we just get to remember that he gave us the best gift. And his name is Jesus. And let's stand. We're going to light our candles this morning as a representation of the light of the world coming into the earth. And what we're going to do today is basically I'm going to have um, someone light one candle at the end of the row, and you're going to pass your light. And we do that as a symbol of what happens when we meet the good giver and we get stirred to share the light with someone else. Some of you are going to go home and talk to your family about Jesus for the first time in a long time. You're going to go home and you're going to show them what it looks like to be in love with Jesus for the first time in a long time. And it's going to matter because he wants them. He wants all of us. He wants all of us. And we will be a people that says, we want you to. We receive the good gift. We want to be in relationship with the Father. Because he is good and he is holy. He is holy.